Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Sorry for the delay. So there was some connection problem. Sorry for the delay. So there was some connection problem. So if you so let me double check. Okay, so welcome all for coming. Okay, let me double check. So if you can hear me clearly, could you please give me some response? Could you please type a one? Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so 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 for today, so we will talk about something that is related to the content of our first week's uh, lectures. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. So we have tried to receive uh, your questions during the weekend, but perhaps uh, it's just the beginning of the semester, so you don't have a lot of questions. So I have prepared something for you. So it should be a very quick uh, tutorial today. And then if you have any questions, yeah, please don't hesitate to ask me. Okay, so one key thing that we have talked about in the last class is something called combinatorial arguments. So combinatorial arguments are something that is, uh, is a way of proving identities. So I, I checked the Wikipedia. So mainly there are two different categories of combinatorial arguments. So the first one is called double counting. So the double counting technique is we try to count the same quantity, a value, which talks about the number of ways of doing things. We count it using two different methods. So in that case, we will have two views of the same quantity so that we can we can get our desired result. And the other type of combinatorial argument is the so-called bijective proof. And for this one, it is used to show that two sets have the same number of items. So by finding a one-to-one -one correspondence, between the items of the two sets, we will see that the two sets will have the same number of items. But this is not the focus of today, so we will talk about double counting. And then we will look at a couple of examples today. So this is the easiest example probably. So in this example, we want to show that n choose k, the value of n choose k, is always the same as the value of n choose n minus k. Now remember, when we are doing combinatorial arguments, we do not have any access to the exact uh, form formula for n choose k. So we don't know n choose k is equal to something like n factorial divided by k factorial and n minus k factorial. We don't know this. We just want to argue the meaning from the physical meaning of each of the terms, and then we want to establish the equivalence of the both sides. Okay. So first of all, n choose k is what? n choose k is the number of ways of selecting k items from a total of n items. So, so by viewing of selection of k items to keep, so it must be the same as we are. So when we try to keep k items, so it must mean that we are throwing away n minus k items. So each time we keep a particular set of k items, we are actually throwing the complements n minus k items there. So the number of ways of selection of k items must be the, the same as the number of ways of discarding n minus k items. So that's why we have n choose k is equal to n choose n minus k. So this is quite easy, right? Now let's take a look at this one. Oh, this is something that I, I just come up uh, now. So, so please help me to double check whether this is correct. So here we are saying that n plus one, the permutation, the number of permutations of uh, p n plus one r. So this is like we have n plus one objects to select, and then we want to select r of them and then make an arrangement. So the number of ways of doing so is always the same as pnr plus r times pnr minus 1. 
So how do we interpret this result? So first of all, we will see that on the left hand side, there is n plus 1r, and on the right hand side, there is nr, right? So n plus 1r and nr, they are different by having one extra object here that we can select. So let's call it a special object. Okay. So the number of ways of getting a permutation with the special object that we can use, so we can classify this into two different types. One is we are going to use we are going to use the special object, and then the other type is we are not going to use the special object. Okay, so here n plus one means that we have n original object plus one new object that we can use. Okay. So so the number of ways of not using the special object must be p n r, right? Because we take that away, we will not consider it. So the number of ways of doing Selection of R objects from the old objects and making an, an arrangement must be P and R. Okay, for the other way, the other way is, so we must include the special object. So by including the special object, so we will first decide in which location will the special object be placed. <clears throat> because in the end, it is an R permutation. There are R's positions that these special objects can be placed. So there are our choice that we can make to place the special object. And then for the remaining R minus one positions, we will need to fill in R minus one objects from the old objects. So the number of ways of doing so is Pn R minus one. Now notice that again in the previous argument that we have just made, we are not looking at any formula for p and r we are just arguing all the things based on the definition of the term p and r and then here we are using rule of product and the rule of thumb these basic rules to help us to understand why this equality must be correct okay so let's take a look of another example so so go home so if, if you want to check your understanding, go home and cover all the voices of this video and let's see if you can come up with the combinatorial ex uh, proof by yourself. Now the next one is called the hockey stick identity. So it is saying that... Uh, ah, there was something wrong here. I'm sorry. So let me see. So. So, so sorry, there is a mistake here. So it must be something like this is n minus one. Sorry. So every term here is n minus one. Okay, sorry. So let me go back again. So it says that C n plus one m m plus one object choosing m object must be the same as the summation of the following terms. The first one is n choose n minus one, and then the next one is n minus one choose n minus one, and then the next one is n minus two choose n minus one, and so on and so forth. We add up the things until what? Until n minus one, n minus one. So why is it, so first of all, before we understand why this is correct though. So let's understand why we call this a hockey stick identity. So basically, this is the Pascal triangle that includes all the combinatorial terms. So one and then one, one and then one, two, one and then one, three, three, one, one, four, six, four, one and so on and so forth. So the hockey stick identity says that if you want to get a term, this term, let's say a particular term here, let's say this is 10 term here, the term 10 here. So we can go leftward and uh, one entry to the previous row and then add up all these along the way all these along the way so 1 plus 3 plus 6 will be equal to 10 so let's look at this 10 again this 10 is equal to what this 10 is equal to 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 so how about this 5 this 5 is equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 how about this 4 this 4 is equal to 3 plus 1 so 
So if we look at the terms that we are considering, it looks like the hockey stick that we play in hockey. Yeah, the hockey stick here. So that's why we call it a hockey stick identity. So why is this correct? So again, here we can come up with a story. Okay. So there are n plus one items here that we can select. So let's label all the items by one, two, three, four, five, up to n plus one. And then we want to select m of them in total. So how many ways are there? Now the first term is the case that we will never select one. So the the, the item one is never selected. Hmm? Ah, sorry. So the item one must be selected. Sorry, this is the item one must be selected. So the item one must be selected. The number of ways that we can do so is because one is already selected. So we will need to find out n minus one items from the remaining n items to make a total number of m items. So we get this term n and the n minus one. So this term here means one is always selected. So for the remaining case, we will need to consider the remaining case, we, will, we can never select one because whenever one is selected, it is already counted here. So this term is what? This term is one is not selected, but two is selected. So in that case, if one is not selected, but two is selected, then what does that mean? So it means that we will need to find out n minus one items from the remaining n minus one items to make a collection of m items. So this talks about the second term talks about one not selected but two selected. And then this is the third term. The third term consider the case that one and two are both not selected, but we need to select three. So in that case we have this one. And and so on and so forth. So lastly, this one, it means that we will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to n minus 1. They are, let me see. They are, so, so basically, so this is, this is the case that a couple of items is not selected. And then, and then, and then what, what must be selected and so on and so forth. So it means that the first n minus m plus 1 items are not selected. So that means that we have only n minus uh, and the m. Yeah, I think you you understand what I mean. So so each of the term here corresponds to one more item cannot be selected. So in the end, we have no choice. So for the remaining, we have just n minus one items left, and so we need to select all of them. So this is n minus one choose n minus one. Okay. So don't worry if you don't understand what I'm talking about so far. So most important thing here is you can go back home and then do this by yourself and then convince yourself that uh, which what each term means okay so also what i'm given here is just one example so you can have your own story the the way of double counting proof is to make a story of what is the quantity on the left hand side and make a story of what is the quantity on the right hand side and then we want to show that these two are these two different stories are, are doing the same thing, are counting the same identities, so that's why they are equal. So you can make your own story. Okay, so how about this one? Okay, so this one is n times n minus 1 choose r is always the same as r plus 1 times n choose r plus 1. So here, so how do we interpret the things here. So here, let's. So it may be a little bit complicated, but let's try to figure out what could the potential meaning of the left hand side. So the left hand side looks like what? Looks like okay. So there's n here, and then you multiply something that just have n minus one to choose. So probably we may think of this as, let's say there are n people, in a in a in a in a class. And then we want to select one of them as the representative. And after that, we want to select an extra R people to be the to be the committee member 
of of the class society, something like this. So all together, there. So we need to select one people as the representative. Let's say the chairman of the class society, and then our extra member for the class society. So there are n ways of selection of the chairman out of n people, and then from the remaining n minus one people, we need to pick out. So this is one way to form a class society: one chairman and then our other members. Now, we can also form a class society using a different way, but then this is exactly doing the same thing. So what we are going to do here is, we first select all the members. Including the chairman for the class society, and after that, we pick the chairman from these members. So how many ways of doing so? So the n choose r plus one ways to select the chairman together with the r members in the class society. So these are forming the the members of the class society first, and then after that, we have r plus one people, and then we need to select the chairman from. From them, so there are plus one ways of doing so. So this time we will see that the right hand side quantity is the number of ways that we can form a class society, and the left hand side is also the number of ways of that we can form a class society. So they must be equal. So that's why they are equal. Again, there is no formula involved. We are just arguing things based on the rule of product here. Rule of product here. That's it. And now, finally, this is what I want to introduce to you today. So, so this is perhaps the most complicated example that、uh, we have. So, this is actually a selected question from from our exam、uh, in two thousand and nineteen. So here we have a very complicated summation thing. And then I didn't tell you what this should be, so you are not proving this is equal to what. But instead, see if we can interpret what is the summation sign here. So after doing the the understanding of this, we may be able to find an easy understanding of what this sum could be. Okay, so this is the summation of. Let's take a look. Okay, so first of all, this time bracket n i here simply means n choose i. So this is another shorthand notation for c n i. So n choose i, and then n minus i choose j. So what does that mean? So first of all, let's take a look of this one. So forget about the summation. Let's understand what this compound, this product means. So it looks like the n people that I want to pick i of them. And then from the remaining n minus i people, I want to pick j of them. Okay, so so here basically we are looking at something like we are trying to we are trying to to make the members the n members of people into three different groups. So i of them in the first group n choose i. I of them in the first group. Right, and then from the n minus i of them, I choose j. So j of them in the second group, and finally n minus i minus j of them in the third group. Okay, now here for j is equal to one up to n minus i minus one. It means that I'm selecting the case that j has to be at least one. And then j can be at most n minus i minus one, so it means what? It means that the second group and the third group cannot be empty. It must have some people inside. Is that okay? Now for here, n minus n choose i here. When i ranges from one to n minus two, it simply means that the first group has at least one people. Is that okay? N choose i one people, and up to n minus two people, so that we can have two people left for the second group and the third group. So all together, what does that mean? If you look at this summation sign, we sum up all the different cases. We are trying to, well, we are trying to, to what? 
to divide the group of m people into three groups, okay, such that each group is not empty. So how many ways of doing so? So any idea? So first of all, if there are no restrictions at all, the number of ways to divide n people into three different groups will be 3 to the power n, right? It is because each particular person can be in group 1, group 2, or group 3. So by rule of product, so the first one has three choice, the second one has three choice, and so on and so forth. So altogether, there are three to the power n different ways of dividing the people into three groups. But then we want to avoid people. So we want to avoid the case that the first group is empty. We want to avoid the case that the second group is empty. And then we want to avoid the case that the third group is empty. So in that case, we need to do a little bit of of what? Of corrections. So 3 to the power n is a little bit more than what we are counting. So, so perhaps we have not done this before, but then we can do something like the principle of inclusion and exclusion. That I guess you have already studied in your discrete math class. So by using the principle of inclusion and exclusion, so the answer should not be just 3 to the power n. It should be something like 3 to the power n minus the cases where one of the group is empty, and then plus the case where two of the groups is, are empty, and then minus the case where three of the groups are all empty. So, so in that case, this is my guess, so you can, you can double check whether this is correct at home. So this is my solution. Okay, so let me write this. So this is my solution. My solution will be this one is equal to 3 to the power n minus the case that exactly, not, not exactly, at least one of the group is empty. So let's say group 0 is empty. So if group 0 is empty, so the, the, the um, sorry, group 1, so let's say we call the groups group 1, group 2, and group 3. Group 1 is empty, so how many ways are there? There are 2 to the power n ways. And then group 2 is empty, there are 2 to the power n ways. Group 3 is empty, there are 2 to the power n ways. But then we have over deducted, so we need to add back the case where group 1 is group 1 and group 2 is empty, so there are 1 to the power n plus 1 to the power n plus 1 to the power n, something like this. So in the end, this should be something like, so after simplification, this should be 3 to the power n, ah, maybe, let's see if I can use, eh, how can I make it into, let me see, format, Font? yeah, I don't know how to, how to change it to the superscript. There should be a symbol here. Let me see, let me see. Uh, like this. Okay, 3 to the power n. It should be something like this. Minus 3 times 2 to the power n. And then finally, plus 3. So, So this is what I would guess. So perhaps you can double check whether this is correct or so this is what I would guess. But to yeah. But the way that we get this it is because we have do the simplification to do the understanding of what this term could mean and because of this we can have a good interpretation so that we can use our existing knowledge to get the answer. Yeah, I hope you like this. So combinatorial proof is very useful because it avoids a lot of difficult uh, uh, computation. So if you want, so later we will have formulas for n choose i, n minus 1, n minus i choose j, something like this. But this is complicated if you want to simplify them. Not to mention that we have a lot of summations here that we need to handle. But 
On the other hand, if we have a way to do this interpretation, then everything could be made easy. Okay, so I think that's all for what I want to show today. Yeah, because this is the first week. Uh, uh, but I want to mention one thing. Okay, so we are going to assume that you will study the materials of OCW recording and also the lecture notes at your own pace by yourself. So roughly speaking, we will have three hour lecture normally in a, in a class. So that's what we are expecting you to, to review three hours of OCW recording every week. So on Thursday, we will talk about a quick class summary of the three hour lectures that you have seen. And then on Tuesday like this, we will answer any potential questions that you want to ask us, or we will prepare something that is interesting for you. So Tuesday class normally will be very short, and then Thursday class normally will be very quick. Okay, but I hope if you find any difficulties in the studying, yeah, please let us know. Okay, so meanwhile, if you have any questions, could you please uh, send to the discussion board here, the chat room here? If not, then yeah, let's meet on Thursday. And happy Moon Festival today. So because I don't see any questions, so let's end the class now. Okay. Thanks a lot for coming. Okay, and then and then see you on Thursday. Okay.